Hello and welcome to episode number 43 of James Bond Radio. James Bond Radio is back with a special tribute episode to Mr. Christopher Lee himself, who sadly obviously recently passed away. So we thought it was a good time to look back at his career um, and and find out a bit more about the man himself. My name's Tom Sears and I'm joined by my good buddy, Chris Wright. Say hello, Chris. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) That was very nice. I wasn't sure if there was something else coming there or whether that was it, but it was nice. I liked it. That was it Um, today. So you, you excited to talk Christopher Lee this week? Oh, definitely. I really like this idea of this sort of character spotlight format as well. I think mm. it would be a cool thing to do is, you know, obviously it's, it's good timing. Well, sad timing with obviously the, the death of uh, Sir Christopher Lee. But, it you know, this sort of format I think could work really well. You and I have both been researching into, uh, you know, his life and various aspects. And the amount of information we found out like staggering stuff Mm. that's happened to this guy in his life is just unbelievable but you know he is the epitome of of the word legend really isn't it is it is crazy when when you when you look into his life and read about what a he was capable of doing like the skills he had and b look into sort of what how he lived his life and the things he did it is one of those things where you're like this is unbelievable. If I didn't know that this was a real man, I would think you were just bullshitting me because yeah, it's unreal. Sure. It's absolutely unreal. And we'll get into some details of that, um, obviously, throughout the course of the episode. But yeah, I mean, this dude is is the definition of a badass in every single way. Um, and uh, yeah, I always just thought of him as Francisco Scaramanga when I was a little boy growing up. But but now I, it's, there's this whole world of, of Christopher mm-hmm. Linus kind of opening up, which is which is great. And and it's it's almost like there's so much information there. It's almost like that character. It's almost like a character, isn't it? It's almost mm. like you know there's enough going on there that it is almost ba- you know based on fiction because yeah. it's there's so much there. But it, it it's a hundred percent true what yeah. we're about there's, to tell you. There's got to be there's got to be a movie made about this dude at some point, like that you know a yeah. biopic of, of Christopher Lee. Though who on earth would play him? I don't know because he's such a striking figure, wasn't he? Like yeah. just to look at and his voice as well is so yeah. striking. I don't, I yeah. can't think of anybody who could possibly. Is, I don't think there's no one that could yeah. that could pull that off. Not that I could. Well, you know, well, some yeah. people obviously can, but it's, there's no one that pulls off the look and and the voice and everything that yeah. comes to mind straight away. They'd have to work at it. But I remember in the last podcast or the podcast before you mentioned that um, you try to get your hands on an autobiography, mm. the autobiography. Yeah. Now, I know that the one that you were looking for had been written, what, 10, 15 years ago or something like I that? Think, I think it might um, have been 94 or something. I think it was oh, really right, 90s. Yeah. I might be wrong there. I can't remember. So it's even longer. So I'd love if there is one that's, uh, you know, brought out in the near future and goes into all this, uh, yeah. because so much has happened even since then in his life. You think yeah. of all the films that he's been in since then. Um, so yeah, if anyone who's listening, you know, if, if you if you hear on the grapevine that there's a, a Christopher Lee autobiography on the way, then please let us know and uh, yeah, we'll have to have a read. Definitely. So before we crack on uh, with talking about uh, Christopher Lee, um, come and join us on Facebook, which is just put James Bond Radio into the search box. Uh, come and follow us on Twitter, which is at James Bond Radio. And of course, you can come over to jamesbondradio.com. I'm loving those actions. Uh, come over to jamesbondradio.com and uh, leave us a comment in under any of the posts. There's tons of uh, cool conversation happening over there. Um, and of course, you can leave us a voicemail message as well. Um, obviously, we have the, the upcoming MI6 mailbag episode where we're going to answer all your questions and all that kind of stuff. So if there's anything you want us to discuss, leave us a message on there or indeed email us or, or messages on Facebook or Twitter or wherever. Um, and we'll uh, we'll talk about that in that upcoming episode. Of course, last but not least, if you wouldn't mind coming to iTunes and leaving us a glowing five star review, because that helps us uh, rank higher in iTunes and attract more listeners and all that kind of stuff. And that really does help us. And of course, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe in iTunes as well, because A, that helps us rise up the charts when everybody downloads their episode at the same time automatically. And B, you never miss an episode. So, you know, it's a win-win all round. So before we crack on with the meat and potatoes of today's episode, it's time for a little bit of Bond trivia. So... I have a question for you today, which may or may not catch you out. I'm, I'm undecided. I don't know whether this is going to get you or not. Right. Um, okay. 
I'm so intrigued. My question of the day is Yes. What does the inscription say on the lighter that Felix gives to Bond in license to kill? Now that I was expecting like a Christopher Lee man with the golden gun related question, so mm. that's actually thrown me a little bit. Yeah. So cigarette lighter, license to kill, what does it say on the on the uh, inscription? It's a good question. Good question. It is a good question. Mm. It is a good question. Okay, so my Bond trivia question for today, Mr. Tom Sears, is related to Christopher Lee and the man with the golden gun. And my question is, what type of ammunition does Scaramanga use? And you can't just say... You know, I can't just say golden bullet. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> all right that yeah. is a good that is a good question actually all right cool good stuff so we will uh you're thinking about it i probably should have come up with a man with a gold gun related question for today's trivia yeah, but right. uh, i wasn't thinking. Right. um so we will obviously reveal the answer to that those questions uh, at some point later on during today's episode so make sure you stay tuned um so let's get cracking with a little bit of theme tune and then we'll get talking about mr christopher lee <laughs> My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. Lucy, as you can see, I have no problem with your personality. Oh, break down 007. Do you expect me to talk? Oh, Mr. Bond, I expect you to buy. So today, as we said, we're talking about Sir Christopher Lee, who is also, his full name, in fact, is Sir Christopher Frank Carandini Lee. I didn't so know that. Whoever, Carandini, eh? Yeah, Carandini. So Christopher Frank Carandini Lee. Now, that's an interesting one. And I think mm. now that we've learned a bit about his, where he comes from, that Carandini sort of, you know why it's there, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. <laughs> so I imagine we'll... we'll We'll uh, we'll expand on his ancestry a little bit later on, so that'll I make think more we sense. Will. Then. Yeah. So, so what we're going to do is basically we've we've found out loads of lovely nuggets about about Christopher Lee, and we sort of segmented them into different parts of his life, and and we'll just go through each one, and then have a little chat about each one, and then mm. go from there. Damn so right. to kick things off, we've got a quote here um, by the man himself. Now this is him discussing his service and his time during World War Two. I've seen many men die right in front of me, so many in fact, that I've become almost hardened to it. Having seen the worst that human beings can do to each other, the results of torture, mutilation, and seeing someone blown to pieces by a bomb, you develop a kind of shell. But you had to. You had to. Otherwise, we never would have won. So that's Christopher Lee referencing his time during World War Two, isn't it? Which is which is yes. tough, isn't it? That's 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 that I have, I've often said. Do you remember when we we uh, read the story about um, Terence Young's helicopter crashing into the river in from Rush with Love yeah. and everybody diving in? Yeah. And there he is, like unbuckling himself and swimming himself to safety. Yeah. Like I feel like the 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 people of that generation are just made of better stuff than we are do you know what i mean i'm pretty sure if i crashed in that helicopter i would be dead do you know what i mean terence young but, just swims out christopher lee like the, he's come from that era of just like i don't know what even the word is i don't even know how to sort of describe it but to go through something like that and come out the other side just says tons about the man himself doesn't it do you well no it certainly does without a doubt do you think that that generation was so hardened and was so much like that because of the war and because of everyone, what everyone went through during the war, you know, that had such a massive effect on everyone. Yeah. That do you think that they've been through the worst that the worst that the earth has ever seen that humans had ever seen, they had experienced it firsthand. You know, you, you hear what he's saying about seeing people, actual real people, you know, being blown up by bombs in front of his eyes. Yeah. You're never going to witness anything that that's like worse than that or, or as hard hitting or as impacting yeah. as that. So it obviously had an influence on these people and that generation. And, and it's almost like this generation, 
are built up on the movies of that and it's all the fantasy and it's yeah. imagination and it's like oh i'm watching what might have happened cinematically but there's no way that you can watch it and put yourself in that position because you can't you can see a million movies and you'll never be that soldier yeah you know it from the standing in the field with with all this going on around him yeah what what that or must her. do to you sort of mentally is is i don't even begin like like you were saying they're seeing so many people die around him all the time so many of these become hardened to it i don't even can't even imagine what that must be like to be you know chatting to your fellow soldier right next to you and then two seconds later they've been killed do you know what i mean that just must mess with your brain um, and especially if obviously you come you're in such a tight-knit group you come to know these people you come to rely on them they come yeah. to rely on you it's almost like family yeah. best mates for sure um and yeah and that sort of happens you know it's it's yeah, must have so, been a, a crazy time absolutely so uh so just to, to kind of kick things off our first little christopher lee nugget concerns his early life which is pretty kind of interesting in itself uh, before he really did anything in the, the sort of acting world or anything like that or, or indie bubble too uh, so nugget number one growing up Lee studied classics at Wellington College where he was also a champion squash player a ridiculously badass fencer and spent his spare time playing on the school hockey and rugby teams at age 17 he saw the death of the murderer Eugene Wademan in Paris the last person in France to be publicly executed by guillotine Lee as a result was quite interested in the history of public executions and reportedly knew the names of every official public executioner employed by England dating all the way back to the mid 15th century so first of all it's kind of like you're describing a Bond like character isn't it you know what I mean he's he's, yeah. he's a champion squash player and an amazing fencer um, and, and all these kind of crazy sort of experiences straight out of the gate um, but like it's funny isn't it like witnessing the last the final public execution so that's like obviously going to be in some square somewhere with crowds of people yeah. gathered around which to me seems like something that would have happened 200 years ago do you know what i mean rather than in the lifetime of of someone like christopher lee yeah no no definitely it's it, it, it is almost like a young bond but a, a young you know it is like that it, if that was in the next young bond mm. novel that sort of you know he was suddenly you know he was this fencer and he happened to witness this execution that wouldn't be out of place in a young bond novel yeah no you're absolutely um, right yeah and now do you think that when he went to see this public execution he was doing it for his own benefit in terms of he was intrigued to see it and to witness it or do you think he just happened to be there or or what? I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know the details about exactly what led him to be there. But I, I guess like there must be some sort of like weird curiosity about something like that. Not saying that's something I would particularly want to see. But if you were say you went to a country that did that, do you know what I mean? There would yeah. be a part of you be like, whoa! Like you would sort of want to have a look in a weird way, wouldn't you? Whether even yeah. if you didn't want to, if that makes any sense. No. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, so I guess on some level at 17, he must have been a pretty sort of like hardened dude already out of the gate to sort yeah. of do something like that. Um, but, yeah. uh, but there we go. Interesting. Yeah. And the fact that he knew the names of all the public executioners. Well, do you know? He, yeah. he, that definitely shows his interest there, doesn't it? So yeah. he, must have, he must have wanted to uh, check he, it out. Yeah, and indeed. I remember reading uh, Bond on Bond, uh, Roger's uh, recent book, and he was talking about Christopher Lee and he says that uh, Christopher had this like amazing photographic memory that he just remembered mm. everything. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I guess like we'll talk more about that later, all the different languages yeah. that he could speak and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, interesting. Yeah. Good skills. There we are. So that was nugget number one. Nugget number two is just as interesting. Christopher Lee actually met Rasputin's killer. Uh, no less. Interesting. So, Legends say that Russian mystic Grigory Rasputin was shot, poisoned, stabbed, beaten, drowned, and still stayed alive. This tale is obviously highly exaggerated. Apart from the natural unlikelihood of it, there's also evidence that British spies were partly responsible for his death. Mm. Um, now, this was due to the incredible influence that Rasputin had over the Tsar's court, who was obviously the powerful, the man in charge of, sort of Russia at the time. Some people believe that one of the primary conspirators, Prince Yusupov, made up the story to paint Rasputin as an evil sorcerer, making Yusupov look less terrible for betraying him. 
Christopher Lee's mother once woke her son in the middle of the night so he could meet some very bizarre guests, Prince Yusupov being one of them, and another of the conspirators, Dmitry Pavlovich. Now, while he doesn't remember the visit very well, it still had a lasting impression on the young man and may have affected his portrayal of Rasputin on the screen many years later. Lee never saw Yusupov again in person, but his life continued to be affected by the Mad Monk's murderer. According to Lee, the film about Rasputin couldn't tell the story properly because Yusupov, and later his estate, would repeatedly sue when they disliked how the popular media portrayed him. So, so an interesting one. Yeah, again, another one. So, yeah. like, I suppose, like, you think about that. Is so his mother woke him in the middle of the night to come and meet this dude. So he's obviously, I mean, you can tell just by looking at the dude that he came from a very like privileged background. Do you know what I mean? It's it's yeah. it's not like he was walking the streets of East London or something as a kid. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? He's he's definitely sort yeah. of his family would have moved around in those kinds of circles. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that's that's incredible. Again, that sounds like something out of a storybook, doesn't it? Rather than yeah. you know being connected in some way to the murder of Rasputin who just yeah. sort of seems almost like a mythical figure really by today's standards doesn't it but he was he like is. there and met the dude that killed him crazy stuff yeah. now this next little nugget is one of those that uh, for me this is one of my personal favorite subjects to talk about which is like world war ii yeah. and especially spying in world war ii i love all yeah. that stuff um, Espionage. and this is where where it gets good okay so nugget number three Christopher Lee was just becoming a young man when World War II began in earnest. Like many of his generation, he went off to fight in the war. However, his story is much more fascinating than most and is shrouded in mystery. During the beginning of the war, Lee was living for a time in Finland and volunteered to help fight, but was not placed in any particularly dangerous assignments. After he returned to England, he joined up with the Royal Air Force in 1940, but wasn't allowed to fly because of a problem with his optic nerve. So he worked as an intelligence officer specialising in specialising in cracking German ciphers. Before long, he was performing the kind of missions for which the phrase, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, was designed. In North Africa, he was attached to the Long Range Desert Patrol, the forerunner of the SAS, after which he was assigned to the Special Operations Executive, better known as Winston Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which is a brilliant title for a, for a, a, a That's section. That's the next Bond film. Yeah, totally. <laughs> now, just to, just to pause there for a second, like that, even that in itself, there is a brilliant book which I've mentioned before called Secret Agent. Um, I wonder, you know, what made me pick that up on the bookshelf in the bookshop, um, yeah. which I, I picked up uh, Secret Agent by a writer called David Stafford, and it's basically a collection of stories about. Um, that Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare during the war. So it's all kind of like true stories about what happened. Um, and it's like sort of normal people who were recruited to be spies in occupied Europe and Paris and all that kind of stuff during the war. It is amazing. I couldn't put it down when I read it. And I, I finished it and I was like, that is one of the best, most entertaining books I've ever read in my entire life. And there we have it. Christopher Lee was one of those spies sent abroad. Like It's all things of like, you know, people sneaking to blow up bridges so the nazis could get their yeah. supplies or or radioing back from paris and things and and getting in foot chases with nazis and all that kind of craziness so check it out secret agent by david stafford anyway i, I digress i continue um he fought the nazis in north africa often often having up to five missions a day during this time he helped retake sicily prevented a mutiny amongst his troops contracted malaria six times in a single year and climbed Mount Vesuvius three days before it erupted. Now, is this just taking the piss or what? Like, <laughs> he's helped retake Sicily, prevented a mutiny amongst his troops, had malaria six times in a single year. That's like once every two months for an entire year um, and climbed Mount Vesuvius three days before it erupted. This dude, before he was like 25, has had more of most people's lifetimes. Do you know what I mean? And that was just yeah. getting started. Uh, which is crazy. Crazy. Um, now, speaking of his kind of exploits during the war, while it would be fascinating to know exactly what he got, got up to, none of his actions have been unclassified to date. So it's still under lock and key. You still don't know 
what Christopher Lee was up to during the war because it was so, so top secret. Um, and the man himself would not elaborate on any details. Uh, apparently, he saw more action than most people imagine and witnessed more than his share of terrible things during the war. The real horror and blood left him unable to be moved by such scenes in cinema, yet he says most soldiers who have witnessed the atrocities of war rarely cry except when seeing off the friends with whom they fought. And by the end of the war, he'd received commendations for bravery from the British, Polish, Czech and Yugoslavian governments. <sighs> that's tough stuff, isn't it? That's, that's, that's really intense. That's a- it's quite a resume already. Yeah. No, I, I mean, just to repeat myself, that is like the life of a young Bond. It, mm. You know, going into the um, uh, the special operations executive and, and, and doing the secret espionage missions. Yeah. And, you know, obviously he wasn't a man behind a desk. He was out doing the business. Yeah. And, you know, to get recommendations from all those countries, he, you know, he must have been... A successful at what he did and and a brave so and so at that again. yeah completely and it's almost like as you're reading this this is almost like a page out of fleming where he's describing a, a bond villain bond's being sent after this dude and it's like you know this is where he got his start this is where i don't know hugo drax got his start do you know what i mean during the war and all that yeah. all those kinds of things you almost yeah. imagine the next thing would be after the war he disappeared nobody heard of him until 20 years later when he yeah. came back and he was a billionaire and, uh, yeah. and, and all this kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? It is, the world, yeah. yeah, it's totally like that sort of description, isn't it? Um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, just to finish up this little section, uh, Christopher Lee spoke English, German, Russian, Swedish, French, and Italian, six languages, and spent his time after World War II hunting Nazis with the Central Registry of War Criminals and Security Suspects until he decided to give acting a try at age 25. So... Uh, it, it doesn't. That you don't age. even know what to say about that, do you? It's like the, yeah. the, what an unbelievable man to, to be capable of all that, learning all that stuff, doing all those things before twenty five. He could have retired at that point, never done anything ever again, and he would still have one of the most interesting lives ever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable that he went through all of that, and uh, and and the fact that you mentioned, you know, he can speak all these languages again at, at twenty five. That's a young age, you yeah. know, six languages. He he was he was talented in in pretty much every endeavor you can think of. In terms of sports, he was that on it. In terms of intellect, he was on it. In terms of being able to you know do the language, uh, you know, strategy, m- military experience. Mm. This, it, 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 you know, he's just got everything, every string to his bow, basically. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, By completely. It. it is like you were describing Bond, isn't it? At the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So I mean, that for me is probably the best of the sort of main nuggets because it describes everything that you know his early life everything that was going on but it relates to bond so much and you know i'm sure you know obviously being a cousin of fleming there must have been parts of fleming where he was looking at christopher lee's life his action being Mm. out in there and that must have had some influence on him creating bond it must have done yeah absolutely i guess i guess the, the crazy thing is though i suppose living through that time and especially being involved in the war itself like christopher annie and fleming obviously were like, I imagine you would come across extraordinary characters all the time, wouldn't you? Do you know what I mean? Especially yeah. being involved in the spying side of things. Uh, but I feel like this dude it just takes things to another level, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely, without yeah. a doubt. Uh, on to Nugget 4 for Christopher Lee. Now, he actually met J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the author of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Um, Lee is famous for playing the wizard Saruman, as everyone knows, in Lord of the Rings, but few people realise just how well fitted for the role he was. Christopher Lee is the only Lord of the Rings cast member who met Tolkien in person. He was quite young when he did, and, and there, he was within a group who met the author in a pub, but he was also a little shocked to be in the presence of his hero, who, and he only said, how do you do? Lee was such a fan of Tolkien's stories that he sent Peter Jackson a picture of himself dressed as a wizard during the casting session. Now, this was only partly a joke. Lee had long desired to play Gandalf, um, who obviously Ian uh, Ian McKellen ended up playing. But in fact, when he did his first script reading in front of Peter Jackson, he read a scene as Gandalf. However, Peter Jackson had always uh, had him in mind to play Saruman. Uh, This is probably likely due to his advancing age. 
Um, Because Gandalf had to do quite a lot of demanding scenes and sort of run around and stuff like that, including sort of horseback as well. Uh, Christopher Lee agreed with the casting choice and was very disappointed with the scenes he shot for The Return of the King were cut from the theatrical release. He was disappointed not just out of pride, but because editing removed something important from the story as well. So there we are. He was a huge fan of Tolkien and he ended up being in, uh, obviously, starring in the film. Interesting, yeah. Could you see him playing Gandalf? Maybe in the earlier days, um, perhaps. I do think he was he was looking I know he's probably made up to look even perhaps older, but he mm. was quite old when when he played Saruman. Yeah, I mean he was nine was he ninety three when he died? Uh yes he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. ninety three. Um yeah, no, obviously he's he's sort of advancing in years and stuff, but I, I feel like I don't know, I feel like he, the, you, I, I struggle to think of Christopher Lee as anything else than a villain. In do you know Hardy. what I mean? He's just yes, got that. Exactly. He's just made to play villains, isn't he? Yeah, so he, I, that's I, exactly I, I don't know whether he'd be sort of, I don't know, it would be interesting to see him play that kind of role, I guess, just because I don't think yeah. in memory I've, I've ever seen him play anything other than a bad guy. Uh, no. But uh, but yeah, interesting. Good, good to see. See, hopefully what it is, Christopher Lee you know, bumps into Tolkien and ends up playing in the movies. Hopefully someday we can interview Barbara and then, you know, they'll cast one of us as Bond or something and then, oh, yeah. you know, or just sort of cascade from there, you know? I, I, I think that's generally how it goes. Yeah, yeah so yeah. There uh, we go. any any day soon, really, isn't it? Well, you, you know what they say <laughs> is like, you know, if you put that that positive energy out into the universe you know it comes back to you apparently that's what they say so let's let's do it man let's do it i we're going to we're going to need a shitload of positive <laughs> energy <laughs> we are indeed, completely so next up we have and this is where things get get uh, a little bit left field for me i think it, it or well, totally unexpected is what i would describe it as yeah. um in that christopher lee recorded multiple heavy metal albums apparently trying to surpass himself with each subsequent musical endeavor while many actors have tried musical side products to ver- projects to varying degrees of success his aren't just vanity products projects their quality recordings and inspire real metal fans in 2014 he released a heavy metal version of frank sinatra's my way which he claimed to sing more operatically than Sinatra did. In 2010, he released his first album, Charlemagne by the Sword and the Cross, focusing on the life of the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne. A few years later, he released a second album called Charlemagne, Omens of Death, enlisting the help of Judas Priest guitarist Richie Faulkner. His second Charlemagne album won him a Spirit of Metal Award. He has also lent his voice to the album Heavy Metal Christmas and released a third Christmas album called Darkest Carols Faithful Sing. How about yeah. that? <laughs> now, wh- where you just wouldn't think of that. I mean, prior to doing this, I think we, we'd both heard a bit of the metal, the heavy metal mm. thing. And I remember listening to his Christmas, one of his Christmas songs, and I was taken aback. I was like, wow. Yeah. But, but getting that information for the first time, you're like, Christopher Lee, you know, an actor in his 90s, and he's doing heavy metal music. It's it's, 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 it's well what is it, it it's just amazing it's just <laughs> totally unexpected but what i love about it is i like it in life when people do things that are unexpected of them in the sense that you know you you, you get to a certain age or whatever and you're sort of you know you're meant to sort of calm down and be a nice little granddad and, and all that kind of stuff yet he has done the most non-grandadly thing you could possibly do which is record metal albums um i love it i think that makes him even cooler than than yeah. you know than he was before good stuff and you know what i think we should play a little uh, excerpt from one of them at the end of this podcast let's do it yeah Sweet. Okay, good stuff. Okay, so for the next nugget of information, uh, Christopher Lee stood at an impressive 196 centimetres, uh, or is commonly known, six foot five. So he was a tall, tall guy. Mm. Though a few actors are taller, uh, James Cromwell is six foot seven. Shaquille O'Neal has done a few parts on screen, although I'm not sure if you'd class him as an actor. Yeah. Um, Guinness names Christopher Lee as the tallest leading actor in history. Now, actors are generally no taller than the than the general population, so directors often manipulate the view of the camera and the shots to make them look taller than they normally are. However, with Christopher Lee, directors have had to do the opposite because he's so tall um, in, in relation to other people that they obviously have to try and make him smaller, mm. although they didn't need to do that in Lord of the Rings, so that was good. 
Now, even more impressive is Lee's other record as a most prolific actor. Now, IMDb credits him with well over 250 roles. I think Guinness mentioned it was something like 270, 280. Other sources put it at over 300, 350, including sort of bit roles and stuff like that. So not only is he a tallest leading actor in history, but he has also starred in more films than any other actor in the history of cinema. Crazy talk, isn't it? That's absolutely unreal. Like, so it's funny, isn't it? Like with with a lot of actors, they are of the the, the short persuasion. You know, you got somebody like Tom Cruise and all those kinds of people, and that's like a typical thing, isn't it? When you you meet an actor and you go, oh, they're not as tall as I thought they were going to be. Do you know yeah. what I mean? That's like a common yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and he's there. He is rocking six foot five. So uh, yeah, interesting. That's uh, that's cool. No no doubt. That's where his kind of imposing figure kind of comes from. Do you know what I mean? Is that his entire stature. Yeah is kind of sort of yeah. imposing in it but uh, but to be the most prolific actor as well with that many roles is again like this is a dude that didn't do things by halves isn't he he's one of those that just <laughs> yeah. went all out in everything yeah um, yeah good good stuff okay so now to uh, for the, the next little nugget obviously a lot of people would know and remember Christopher Lee for playing Dracula um, so for the next little nugget, when Christopher Lee's acting career was still in its infancy, he played the role of Dracula in a series of films by Britain's Hammer Film Productions. Later entries in the series were not very well written or put together, and many have wondered why such a great actor continued to appear in terrible films over and over. He wasn't a fan of the later scripts at all. He had no desire to continue doing the films, and he told his producers so explicitly. However, in what Lee himself described as emotional blackmail, the executives in charge convinced him by telling him that they had already sold it to the Americans with him in it. When he was still reluctant, they pointed to all the people who would lose work if he refused to do the films. He was bothered at being manipulated this way, but he agreed to stick with the role so interesting yeah well that just shows you like what i mean it's a bit unfair because obviously they manipulated him into doing it but he was doing it for the good of the other people mm. you know if someone says if you don't do this all these people are going to lose their jobs he wasn't thinking about himself by any means because he obviously didn't want to do it he was thinking about other people, even yeah. though perhaps that might not have been the case, and they were obviously using that against him, which is a bit, which is a bit harsh. But it's a, like a lot of things, isn't it? Generally, when you get sort of series or franchise, aside from obviously James Bond, mm-hmm. when they get past a certain point, you know, if you're hitting half a dozen plus um, episode, you know, versions or films, they tend to reach a point where they hit the wane. And then they die like a horrible death. Yeah. You know, generally you'll get, you know, the first three or four, maybe not so bad. Well, the fourth one, it tends to wane. If you get to six and beyond, it's like, okay, there's no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Obviously, Bond is the massive exception within the cinematic history. Yeah. And, and and I'm sure the Dracula versions were similar to that. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, but you would imagine a lot of actors today would would wouldn't even give that a second thought, would they? They'd be like, no, if I get, I'm not doing it, and off they would off they would go. Yeah. So uh, yeah, That's good it. on him for that. Nice one. So the next uh, Christopher Lee nugget we have now. This is another singing related one. So we've we've heard about his heavy metal sort of side, but conversely, probably the most complete opposite of music that you could do, there was also an operatic side to him and, and, and also the rest of his family. So the Lee family has long had opera in its blood. Christopher's grandparents started the first opera company in Australia. Lee had a natural talent for music and sang in public venue at an early age. So not only was he good at sport and, and everything else, he, could, he was a classically trained singer as well, which is pretty damn good. Now, the tenor, Husey Björling, one of the best opera singers in the world, wanted to nurture the young man's natural talent and invited him to join the opera house permanently. Unfortunately for opera, but very fortunately for the silver screen, Christopher Lee decided he wanted to go into acting instead. It's clear from his recent musical endeavours, though, that he never forgot his love for singing, and Björling might have been proud of him to this date. So there we are. So... Could have been an opera singer as well. Yeah, yeah, man. It's, isn't it funny how like some people just get born with these incredible genes where they are just talented at yeah. everything that they could possibly lay their hands to? Uh, but yeah. there you go, opera singer. Good God. Yeah. Next up, and this is where things get a little bit spooky. 
following on from the Dracula mm. thing, um, Christopher Lee allegedly had a uh, an interest in the occult due to his history of playing such villainous characters as Dracula, Scaramanga, Count Dooku and Saruman, as well as his love for heavy metal. Many people are convinced that Christopher Lee was an enormous fan of the occult. Rumours go so far as to claim that he owned the largest collection of occult literature in the entire world, with anywhere from 2,000 to 20,000 occult books in his library. Asked about this in an interview, he was very clear that the stories were not at all true. He first joked that to even have that many books, he would need to live in the bath, but then became quite serious about the matter. While he has some interest in the occult, he admitted to owning maybe five occult books. That does not mean he takes any part in such practices or puts any stock in them. Taking a question from the audience, he explained that he has met Satanists, but he warned everyone in the audience away from delving into such matters. If you get involved, you will not only lose your mind, you will lose your soul. That's what he says. He then lightheartedly criticised the media for simply making the whole thing up because they had nothing else to say. So what do you think about that? Wow. So, I mean, I'd never heard of the whole occult library rumour, but obviously everyone that he's played, all these villains and and, and horror-related articles, I suppose, that's a story that sprang up. But, you know... We go back a bit to the public execution. It is not too dissimilar in a way to the occult. So, mm. You know, it's it's kind of the legalized version or or the uh, open to the general public version, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, okay, it might not have the the religious aspect, but you still got the the sort of the death there, haven't you? And he obviously had an interest in that. Yeah. So it's. It, I think it was just another thing that caught his attention that. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose maybe he just had a little, things. little a curiosity for the kind of the weird stuff. I suppose, which, yeah. uh, which you know, makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of people would. But whether he had a library of up to twenty thousand books, that's the difference yeah. between being a little bit interested and really interested, yeah. isn't it? Do you know what I mean? But, uh, but I, yeah, I think probably the people that started the rumors were you know huge fans of Dracula mm. or, or or whoever who were like, yeah, I want him to actually be Dracula. It's almost like us when we meet Daniel Craig. When we meet when we're gonna meet him. You know, when we meet Daniel Craig, we meet him all the time. All the time. And we're like, ah, oh, obviously we we wouldn't because we kind of know that now, but mm. so many people want uh, the actors who portray Bond to be Bond. You know, yeah. they go up to Roger Moore or whatever, you are Bond, you're Bond. And I'm sure the whole thing about him having an occult library was ah, oh, you know, you're Dracula, he must he must have all this sort of stuff. Yeah, That's yeah. probably where it stemmed from. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. But interesting. Interesting. So on to, now this we're kind of going back into the military side of things, mm. which which is for me the most fascinating side. Now, Christopher Lee knows the sound of a backstab. Now, I'll elaborate on this further with this little nugget. So while we can only guess at what sort of classified things Christopher Lee got up to, while he was in the SAS, one incident during the filming of The Lord of the Rings gave us insight into the kind of action that he saw. In a scene reserved for the extended version of The Return of the King, underling Grima Wurmtang stabs Saruman in the back. Now, director Peter Jackson was coaching his actors on how to approach the scene when something unexpected happened. Christopher Lee asked Jackson if he knew what it sounded like when someone was stabbed in the back, and he followed it up with, because I do. Now, according to Peter Jackson, Christopher Lee then began talking about some clandestine part of World War II, although, as always, he withheld details. Jackson had wanted him to shout in pain when he was stabbed, but... Lee explained that when you're stabbed in the back, you rarely make a noise because the breath is driven out of your lungs. And he gave a good impression of what it would actually sound like, more like a strangled grasp. So there we go. Well, how about that? Yeah, that's that's some uh, that's some that's some dark shit, isn't it? Right there. That's uh, it is. That's that's good. Cool. I, I imagine he's one of these people that if if you had him over to dinner. And he and he was willing to, even if he wasn't, but if he was willing to divulge some of his World War II secrets, he would be the sort of person you could speak to every day for a month or possibly more and just never get bored of those stories. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, or you, he'd have a different story for each day because he's so much stuff has happened yeah, to him yeah. by the but sounds it's, of it. it. It's one of those things that, not that you would want to experience things like that, but it makes you realise just how sort of like insulated we are in the modern day from things like that or i suppose you could say we're lucky enough to be insulated from things like that but uh, but yeah interesting um next christopher lee nuggets 
Christopher Lee is incredibly well connected in Hollywood due to his prolific career and his family was well connected on a social level as well. The family from which Sir Christopher Lee hails is the same family that eventually found their way to the New World, making him related to the American Civil War General Robert E. Lee. Christopher Lee was also a cousin to Ian Fleming, another man whose name is synonymous with cloak and dagger operations from the World War II area. I'd like to learn more about him. He sounds like an interesting chap. Yes, um, he certainly does. It's possible that some of Fleming's written adventures were based in part on Christopher Lee's work in the SAS as well as Fleming's. Mm. Now these and all of his other interesting relations pale in comparison to another one. Christopher Lee made both his albums about Emperor Charlemagne of the Holy Roman Empire because of a family connection. Christopher Lee's mother was an Italian countess and a descendant of Charlemagne himself. His family is quite proud of the fact, still bearing the coat of arms to prove it. One of Lee's ancestors on his mother's side was the Papal Secretary of State, who refused to attend the coronation of Napoleon and is buried in the Pantheon in Rome next to Raphael. That's the painter. Um, Lee's father, meanwhile, was a distant relative of Robert E. Lee and was a multi-decorated war hero who served as a colonel in the 60th King's Royal Rifle Corps during World War I and the Boer War. So very, very wow. well to do family, obviously, like we said before, like yeah. you can just tell he's from that stock, can't you? But like yeah. to be good stock, that's exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> to to be directly related to a you know a Roman emperor is like whew, that's a bloodline and a half, that one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's not yeah. bad. It's not bad um, at all. Now this was a cool little thing that I that we, we dug up, which was uh, a cool little story. In the 50s, uh, Christopher Lee was engaged to Henriette von Rosen, daughter of Count Fritz von Rosen. The Count apparently didn't like Lee because after hiring private detectives to investigate the actor and demanding references, he also refused to allow his daughter to marry him unless Lee got the blessing from the King of Sweden. So Christopher Lee goes to the King of Sweden and gets his blessing and then goes on to marry her. So that's one of those things, isn't it? If I said to you, get the blessing of the King of Sweden, it'll be like, ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. I've, I've, drawn, <laughs> I've drawn a blank there. Whereas he just sort of yeah. marches in the front door and gets it. But yeah. yeah. I wonder if I wonder if he did the whole, played up the whole Charlemagne angle. For, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure he probably did. But like, the, the, isn't like that that kind of, I don't know, that, that bloodline coming all the way through, like obviously a very well-to-do family and, and, and of good stock and all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. again, that sounds like the ultimate Bond villain, doesn't it? The description of, of, of that man, it you know? It, it sounds does. like fiction. Yeah, no, it does. It really does. And, I mean, I wonder if you could almost pillage that for the next Bond villain. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's strange, isn't it? Some of it, at least. But, yeah, I mean yeah it's, it's more fascinating stuff and yeah. now on to the next nugget now this is is to do with his acting career which obviously as we've heard is uh, the most successful in cinema history in terms of at least the amount of most prolific time. so most prolific indeed now in addition to playing the good old francisco scaramanga dracula saruman camp duku and lord Summerisle, christopher lee has been fu manchu no less than five times the definitive Count de Rochefort in a couple of the Three Musketeers movies. He's also been The Mummy, Frankenstein's Monster, Willy Wonka's Dad, <laughs> The Emperor... <laughs> That's Willy my favourite one, Willy Wonka's Dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Emperor of China, The Grim Reaper, Lucifer, Grigory Rasputin, Charles Marlowe, Ramses... Tyrius, the blind prophet of Thebes, and Vlad the Impaler. Goodness all me. lovely characters. Yeah. All very friendly, friendly people. Yeah. He's worked with Laurence Olivier, Peter Cushing, Jimmy Stewart, Charlton Heston, Errol Flynn, Patrick Stewart, Steven Spielberg, Orson Welles, Vincent Price, Christopher Walken, Sam Elliott, and Jane Mansfield. Not forgetting He's Mr. Rogermore. Per- oh, yes, indeed. He's the only person to play both Sherlock and Mycroft Holmes. He was also Sir Henry Baskerville. His characters have executed both Charles I of England and Louis XVI of France. He's portrayed Englishmen, Egyptians, Spaniards, Transylvanians, Frenchmen, Greeks, Poles, Chinese, Indians, Italians, Wallachians, Romans, Germans, Arabs, Gypsies and Russians. Just a few. And I, I imagine he speaks um, all those languages as well, probably. <laughs> yeah. He's played the lead role in the biography of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. 
IMDB credits him with 274 acting roles, although maybe more now. Guinness says he's appeared in more films than anyone ever, and if that's not enough, Lee's movies have grossed more than any actor ever. His top five alone have grossed over $4.5 billion. It's pretty, it's quite yeah. <laughs> Lee has appeared in more on screen sword duels than any other actor ever. He's a masterful fencer, as we mentioned earlier. He's been in everything from cutlass fights on the decks of waterlogged pirate ships to rapier duels in 17th century France and lightsaber battles across the galaxy in Star Wars. That's cool. Now, while filming, that is pretty, I mean, that is a badass right there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> completely, completely. Um, while filming a sword fight with a drunken Errol Flynn during the filming of The Dark Avengers in 1955, Flynn accidentally cut Lee's hand so badly his finger nearly came off and permanently injured, which, you know, he wouldn't have been able to fire his golden gun then, would he? Mm, absolutely. So uh, later, during the same film, Lee cut off Flynn's wig while Flynn was still wearing it. Uh, Flynn stormed off set and refused to come out of his trailer until Lee claimed it was an accident. <laughs> so he obviously... So as much as I hate to reference it, that that's kind of sounds like the scene in Die Another Day, doesn't it? With uh, Bond versus Graves. <laughs> it and, does. Uh, and one-upping each other throughout the whole experience. Yeah. Interesting. That's it. Cut, cutting off the finger and then chopping off the wig. <laughs> yeah. You know, I must like, imagine if you were there on set that day when that happened and yeah. you were just witnessing that. It'll be like, whoa. I mean, the uh, the, the thing with uh, with that that history, I think something that I feel like I should do at some point is is spend more time looking at the, the other works of people who've been in Bond films. Do you know what I mean? Like the Bonds yeah. themselves, obviously, but then somebody like Christopher Lee, such an interesting dude and such a like a yeah. varied film career. Like I bet there's some real amazing movies in there that, uh, that that are sort of just ready to be pillaged and watched. You know what I mean? Definitely. definitely. Yeah. Well, that's a good shout out to the listeners, actually. If any of the listeners have, if every aside from the Man with the Golden Gun, aside from Lord of the Rings, aside from Star Wars, and I, I guess a Wicker Man would be up there as well. Mm. But aside from those films, if our JBR listeners could list their favourite Christopher Lee film. And then we'll we'll have a look, and maybe whatever one gets the most votes, we'll uh, we'll have a little viewing and uh, check it out. Absolutely, good stuff. So, he, if if there is a section that needs to be titled "Other Achievements," I don't know. I think it's taking the taking the Mickey a little bit, having so many achievements. <laughs> yeah. But uh, our next little nugget: Christopher Lee was also a master golfer. Of course, he was. He once played with Jack Nicholas and is the only actor to be a member of the Honourable Company of Edinburgh Golfers, the most prestigious country club in the world. He was made a Knight Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. That sounds a bit like Bill and Ted, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> in 2009, a Commander of the Venerable Order of St. John in 1997, made a Commander of the Order of Arts and Letters by the French government in 2011, earned the British Academy of Film and Television Arts Fellowship in 2011, received the Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement in 1994, and so many more. And perhaps most impressive of all that, despite everything you've heard, um, the uh, with the game The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, where you, you, you can get to Kevin Bacon from any actor in the world within six steps, Christopher Lee was recognised as being the most connected actor in the world in 2008, again by the Guinness Book of Records. He connects to virtually any actor in 2.59 steps, beating Bacon by far. So it should be wow. Six Degrees of Christopher Lee. Yeah, well, or two or three degrees, or of two course, 2.59 degrees. degrees. Of course, doesn't need six. <laughs> what am I talking about? What a bellend. So, uh, there we go. Yeah. So, so that is, um, that is kind of Christopher Lee's kind of life and career sort of summed up, however, briefly. I imagine there are a million more stories than what we've kind of covered. Um, so I imagine that it, that autobiography would be an interesting read, but it says that he never revealed much about his wartime stuff. So it would, that I feel like that would be the most intriguing stuff, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, we, I was just about to say, you could take any decade or possibly any sort of five years of his life and, and almost make a film of it yeah. because he's had that much experience and that much going on through his time. And you never know, the, these sort of things that are still classified, one day they might come out. And if they do, yeah. you know, I, I'd be the first to to buy the book to read it. And also, I mean, what a film um, that it would make as well. Yeah, yeah, totally. Good stuff. So, 
So, uh, so we thought we'd we'd kind of end this uh, this sort of main section with uh, with another quote that does definitely make you, excuse me does definitely make you think um, uh, about this dude's life. He said, "When you're involved in a war, it's the old saying: if your name is written on the bullet, written on the bullet, there's nothing you can do about it." So you just banished it from your mind. Of course, I was scared on some occasions and anyone who says they aren't scared during an operation probably isn't telling the truth. I know about six people who had no fear, fear, literally none. Whether that was due to a lack of imagination or because they'd conquered it, I don't know. In fact, was one was Ian Duncan Smith's father, who was one of my closest friends. But during a war, people are told to kill and they have the blessings of the authorities to do so. So if it's your life or somebody else's, you want to be quite sure it's not yours. So, yeah. first of all, name on the bullet, just like in Man with the Golden Gun. That's a little yeah. uh, little like foreshadowing that. there. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith is uh, is for people who aren't in uh, the British Isles is a uh, is a politician. So his dad uh, was obviously fought Jimmy alongside British. Christopher Lee at some point. But uh, but there we go. So what an interesting dude. So we thought we'd round it out with our top 007 Scaramanga moments. Which uh, which oh, I thought yeah. is is quite fitting, so I think we should have a jingle, shouldn't we? Scaramanga moments. Are we going to go? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Scaramanga moments. Go. Yeah. So basically, so this is a 007 Scaramanga moments, we, and this is in order. So we're going to go from. I mean, all of them are amazing, and and mm. people love all of them. But obviously, we'll start with number seven, work our way down to number one. So yeah. this is number seven. Scaramanga moment. This is a bonus. Goes with the Solex, no extra charge. And I am now undeniably the man with the golden gun. Lunch. Now, what a line. That is a line, isn't it? Yeah. Beautiful it's stuff. Great. Yeah. And that's one of those that part where he blows up the plane is such a like a, a trailer moment, isn't it? Like it gets used all the time. It is. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful moment. Good stuff. And so, it just, Bond knows he's then stuck on the island, doesn't he? He can't get away. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's an, another one of the few Bond films where you hear the title in the film. Which is yeah, cool. that's always a nice little moment when that happens. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. So, Bond moment, Scaramanga moment number six. You uh, live well, Scaramanga. As a million dollars a contract, I can afford to, Mr. Bond. You work for Peanuts. A hearty well done from Her Majesty the Queen and a pittance of a pension. Apart from that, we are the same. To us, Mr. Bond, we are the best. There's a useful four-letter word, and you're full of it. <laughs> Very nice. And that, <laughs> that little moment for me is like, yeah. it's one of those things, like when we reviewed Man with the Golden Gun, we were saying that they are kind of like, they are almost one and the same in the sense that they've just gone on yeah. two different paths. You've got two people who are expert kind of hitmen in a sense, and then one of them works for Queen and Country, the other one works for a profit kind of thing. So I feel like that moment really sort of shows, as similar as they are in some respects, shows how different they are as well at the same time. Yeah. Because yeah. you've got the dark side and the light side. Yeah, honest. completely. It's quite cool. moment number five. Now, this this is my personal. I I love this moment. I think it, it, yeah. if it if it isn't my favourite moment, which the other ones do outrank it, it is still right up there. 
which is the moment where obviously he needs to, his thing is he's got to get his rocks off and he before he performs a, a hit and i just love that scene where he just strolls in miss anders waiting there in the bed and he gets his gun out and he rubs it all over her face he's sticking it up her nose and in her mouth and all that kind of stuff i love that because i tell you why yeah because a if you're a bomb villain you've got to have a physical deformity which he has he's got the nipple but B, you've got to be a bit of a deviant as well. And I think this is, yeah. this is you know, it shows a bit of deviance. He's just like, and when she doesn't respond well, like he he gets a bit angry, doesn't he? Do you know what I mean? He's like, he, he, does. he, 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 does. he furrows his brow. He's not happy with it. He wants to rub his gun all over her. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Yeah, it's, it's a nice parallel for, for another part of his anatomy, for sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, no, I like this bit as well. I think it's great because he is quite calm and and you know very sort of cool throughout the film you rarely see him get agitated or angry mm. you know he's such a cool customer but this is one of the few times where you know he, he he wants to you know show his power and his domineering and you know like you said he's just putting his gun all over his yeah. in the mouth and like and like dropping the bed cover down and stuff like that and then yeah, yeah he just gets he gets like you can tell he's proper He's not happy with her, is he? He's when not happy with it. She turns away and stuff. No, but it's a great not. moment. I, I, I think it's a great moment, yeah. So for Scaramanga moment number four, and this 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 little bit for me is a great bit of backstory that that is is amazing. Okay, so here we go. I think all good all good villains need a solid backstory. Don't they, they certainly do. Good stuff. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> when I was a boy, I was brought up in a circus. My only real friend was a magnificent African bull elephant. One day, his handler mistreated him, and he went to the circus. Bleeding, dying. He came and found me. He stood on one leg, his best trick. Picked me up and put me on his back. The man emptied the gun to his eye. I emptied my stage pistol into his. An eye for an eye. Not. You see, Mr. Bond, I always thought I liked animals. And I discovered that I like killing people even more. Now, that's <laughs> a brilliant line, isn't it? Yeah, that's superb, isn't it? I mean, that just tells you how much, you know, what he, what his obsession is or what his passion is. And, you know, we, again, we talk about villains and obsession and his obsession is killing, basically, and doing it in the most artistic way to him, isn't it? And and, mm. and and obviously he does it for money and, and everything as well. But that is that is his main thing in life, isn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah, absolutely. I like how he calm, how calmly he delivers that as well. They're just sitting there, yeah. um, and just yeah. like talking about this horrible stuff and just so blasé mm. about it. It's nice. You see, Mister Bond, like every great artist, I want to create an indisputable masterpiece once in my lifetime. The death of 007, mano a mano, face to face, will be mine. You mean stuffed and displayed over your rocky mantelpiece? That's an amusing idea, but I was thinking in terms of history. A duel between titans. My golden gun against your Walther PPK. Each of us with a 50-50 chance. Six bullets to your one? I only need one. Brilliant, isn't it? Isn't that good? What a line! Like what yeah. a line! Bond I mean, always has the comebacks. This time, tables turned on their head. Like oof, that yeah. that that sets a tone, doesn't it? Like a, a level of expectation yeah. as well, um, which I think is a brilliant Scaramanga moment. Bloody love it! 
So good. And like, it just shows you his confidence over Bond as well, doesn't it? Mm. He's like, I know, you know, I respect you more than anyone else in the world because you're, you know, you're the best MI6 agent and and you're brilliant, but I'm better than you. Yeah. And and this is how I'm going to prove it, you know? And it's just such a good moment. I love that. It is good. Great to see that. Scaramanga moment number two is the duel between Bond and Scaramanga. Monsieur, I will remind you this is a duel à la mort. Only one of you can leave the field of honor. If a coup de grâce is necessary. As your referee, I will administer it myself. I do not expect wounds, only a clean kill. On my command, each contestant will take 20 pesos. Are you ready, Monsieur Scaramanga? Ready. Are you ready, Monsieur Bond? Ready. I will now begin the count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17, 18, 19, now, again, that's another iconic moment, isn't it? That shot of them back to back on the beach with kind of, you know, whether it's a close up or whether it's like over Nick Knack's shoulder where he's standing on that little yeah. low bit. Um, I think like that duel, like I think the duel comes close to number one for iconic moment in terms of Scaramanga moments. But yeah. there is one scene that kind of, for me, I think rules above the duel. And would would you agree with me there, Chris? I would. I'd put it as the best scene in the film, probably. Mm. Um, I think the duel, the duel has got a lot to answer for as well, because we kind of saw that in the pre credit sequence, but now we get to see Bond versus Scaramanga. And you get to see Bond being sort of outwitted, to a certain extent, mm. by Nick Knack, while Scaramanga is almost stalking the the funhouse. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I did like about the duel is at the end, when when obviously Bond is the mannequin and then shoots uh, Scaramanga, the look on Christopher Lee's face mm. when he's realised that Bond has bested him is yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah. You know, it shows complete and utter shock and horror, purely from him being so confident that he was going to win and now he suddenly realised and I think that moment is brilliant that, that's, yeah. that's a great moment that one. yeah it is nice isn't it good stuff cool so the number one Scaramanga moment a what do they teach in that school? Ballet dancing? I find nothing remotely amusing about Mr. Bond's escape. You underestimated it. Even my influence doesn't extend into the British Secret Service. I shall lie low too. I don't intend to jeopardize a project in which I've invested half my fortune when it's ready to yield billions. And where will you hide out? That does not concern you. Take this. Return it to the plant and don't leave there without my permission. May I remind you that you work for me. I took you on as a junior partner to be an occasional convenience, nothing more. I did not hire you to interfere in my affairs. Is that clearly understood? Yes, very clearly. I now regret having even considered employing your services. But that is beside the point. Bond doesn't know you're in Bangkok. He's never seen you, but he knows me. That's the problem. There's no problem. Just resigned. 
I'm the new chairman of the board. He always did like that mausoleum. Put him in it. That is so cool, isn't it? The way he's just sitting at the desk. He's being chewed out by high fat. And there he is calmly assembling the gun. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, that is, for me, probably the best scene in the film. Definitely, I think, the best scene that shows Scaramanga's coolness, his calculatedness, and his disregard for high fat. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I mean, that is such... I know it does get mentioned quite a bit, but there's a good reason for it, and and it's it's fantastic. It's, it's probably the best scene with the actual golden gun as well, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, brilliant scene, and it just it just shows how cool he is. And then straight after that, he's like, he always did like that mausoleum, put him in it, sort of yeah. thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, I love. I think it's great. Great. It moment, is right. brilliant. I love that moment. Not only does it, like you say, show the golden gun as it is, like as individual items being kind of built together. It's like the calmness, the way he does it, the kind of ruthlessness, no ruthless way he just kind of dispatches high fat brilliant excellent stuff so that about rounds out the christopher lee tribute doesn't it it does indeed yeah um i i hope we did it a justice because i mean that man like we said before he's a legend unbelievable mm. life that he had yeah. and uh i just it's just been great that he's been able to sh- share it with everyone through sort of acting and heavy metal <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> through those various mediums absolutely good stuff yeah so it's time to answer the Bond trivia questions of the day. Bond trivia. Oh, very okay. nice. Okay, so I think you went first, didn't you? I did. And my question of the day, Chris Wright and JBR listeners, is yes. what did the inscription say on the lighter that Felix gives to Bond in License to Kill? Now, that was a good question. And it, because we haven't reviewed it, mm. it's I haven't seen any of the latter films since we started, which is crazy because by now I would have watched probably them all at least two or three times, yeah. like normally within that space of time. But anyway, okay, so the lighter given to Bond by <clears throat> Felix and Della says, To James, love always, Della and Felix. It's it. You've got it right, but there's just oh. one. Little, it says something else. No. Okay. You've, let you've me put think. in an extra word that that isn't there. It's very. Oh, minor. oh sorry. And yes, it, I know what it is. It's on. James. Love always. Della and Felix. Very good. I was sorry. being very nitpicky. Get rid of the two. Yeah, no, no, you, no. That's right because the two yeah. shouldn't have been there. Yeah, James. Love always. Della and Felix. Excellent. There it is. Don't you cool. want to know why? <laughs> It is, yeah, very nice. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Cool, okay, so my trivia question was, what ammunition does Francisco Scaramanga like to use? Now, I've got I've got some information here, and if you can hit me with as much as this, I'll be really impressed. If you can do half of it, that's great, but I want more than a golden bullet. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, do you know what? I My mind is going back to that scene with Lazar, and and all that kind of stuff and i just my memory is not serving me well i all i can remember is golden bullet i can't remember anything else so you've stumped me today okay i've got i've got a little bit that might help do you remember when they were in q's lab uh with q and colthorpe and they're talking about the bullet yes what do you remember anything about the bullet from that scene is the word nickel used somewhere yes that's part of it so why not India? Nickel content, obviously, too low. Double oh seven. It's part of it. Very nice. So, yeah. so um, Scaramanga's bullet of choice is a soft twenty-three karat gold dum dum bullet with low traces of nickel. Very nice. So there we are. Good stuff. That's that was a, answer, that was a very I, good question. Yeah, it's not bad. Well, I'll definitely give you uh, give, give you marks for the nickel content. So you Thank you. That, so that's cool. Here we are, Bond Trivia done and dusted. Good stuff. What time is so it now? I, th- I think for... you should do. I think you should go for it this time. You want me? You want to flip? You want to flip? Flip it around? All yeah. right. Okay. Cool. It's yeah. time for guess a quote round. Bond, 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 Bond. James Bond. 
Yeah, it wasn't so as good, good as you, man. You've got it down after no. all this time. I, I did too yeah, many bombs. I, like it, I like. felt bad about the performance. But, you know, there we go. Thank you for being <laughs> encouraging. Good, good stuff. That's all right. No worries. So my quote from last yes. time was, I'm looking for Mr. James Bond. Any ideas? Now, I, I remember when I first heard it, I definitely thought sort of, 60s and early films because of the accent you mm. just don't get that sort of accent accent in sort of modern bonds do you so it's definitely back then um there was a character that actually jumped out straight away well reasonably straight away now it's a character who i don't know the name of okay. which is also rather rather um rather bad but i think it is in fact one of the very first characters we see in the Bond series. Not the first, but mm. one of the first. Um, and I think, I believe, it is the person looking for a Mr. James Bond at Le Circle Les Ambassadors Casino in Doctor No, and he comes in to see James Bond and ask the doorman. You're absolutely right. Well done. And you know what? I don't know his name either, but I know... No. I, do you know why? Because the person on the desk, he's I'm looking for Mr. James Bond. And then the, the, the concierge says... Uh, you know, like, what's your name or whatever? And he goes, yeah. just give him my card, will you? And then you don't yeah. find out as far and as you I'm don't aware. Know. Yeah, you don't know. No, I don't think you do, do you? Yeah. I'll have to, in fact, we'll have to have a look, maybe look that up and see if he's got a name or maybe yeah. he's just man looking for Bond. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that accent though is spot on, man. Really Thank good. you. Really good. Thank you Okay, much. so my quote for this week, I'll, I'll have you know it's not in a foreign language. Oh. So you'll be pleased to know All right, cool. it's not a foreign language, and um, well, I'm not. Uh, um, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll just go for it, shall we? I'll just wing it, shall we, Mrs. Mm. Bell? Let's, Let's do it. it. Okay, <laughs> my quote for today is: Look at my eyes. Look at my eyes. Look at my eyes. Oh yeah, I think I've got that. Yeah, I've got that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Very good, nice. Good, right, yeah. good, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th- I thought I'd uh, mix up a bit with that one, right. but. Uh, very cool. Good. There we go. So we will reveal the answers to well, the answer to Chris's quote in the next episode. Now, in our last episode, we had a quote from Mr. David West, which was this one. I enjoy that. What do you think, Tom? So, well, like I say, I know who this who this is. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, you so, said you so know, didn't you? I, I'm not t- partaking in the game this week. No. But any, right. what, what okay. are your thoughts? Well, I mean, there is someone that, that that did jump to mind straight away. Now, like I mean, like I said before, to to be able to pull off something like that without without help from dialogue and stuff is pretty impressive. So nice one, David. I think the person that came to mind immediately, and I, and I mean, there are other people it might be close to, but I think the person that stood in my mind was uh, Chang. From Moonraker or Char, as other people like to call him. Now, I don't think we got a follow-up message from David revealing the answer, but that is not correct. Now, <sighs> what happened was when uh, when I met him back in April at the Golden Eye screening, I said to him, "You yeah. got me stumped on that quote. What is it?" And he revealed it to me, and that's that's how I know. So, so do we find out next week? It it, it did stump week? me. Well, I can reveal the answers now. And then, oh, okay. because I know what it is, and then maybe, yeah. maybe if any explanation is needed, David can call in with it with a bit of follow up action. Is so, it anyone from You Only Live Twice? No, I'll give you a clue. Okay, it's somebody who has starred in multiple Bond films and may or may not be a Bond actor himself. Wow. I'd only be guessing, so that's not fair. So go and hit me with it. It's Pierce Brosnan. Really? For what film? <laughs> I'm not sure. That's why it caught me. Apparently, it's a, it's a sound that Pierce makes throughout most of his films, or at least some of them. So, yeah. So, David West, you've stumped both oh, of wow, us okay. with that question. Yeah. So, we, we require you to, to call in, leave us a message, and uh, and and perhaps re-perform it and and and, and show yeah. us some of the scenes where he makes that noise. But uh, that was that was remarkably like Chag from Moonraker <laughs> yeah. when, when he's in his Aikido yeah. gear. Yeah, wow. Maybe, okay, yeah. we'll have to we'll have to look out for that. But there we Good go. stuff. Cheers, David. So, have we cheers got any other new 
We oh, certainly do. We have a new quote Ooh. from JBR listener Ralph Lewandowski, who we'll all remember from Ooh, the, uh, the first birthday episode, um, keeping the German end up. Um, and he sent us this quote. Hello, Tom. Hello, Chris. It's Ralph from Hamburg here with a quote for you. It's a pretty obvious one, but it's still fun to do, so I thought I'd just give it a go. So here it is. <clears throat> I am a professor of forensic medicine. Believe me, Mr. Bond, I could shoot you from Stuttgart and still create the proper effect. That was it. Keep up the good work, guys, and have a spectacular day. Or should I say, spectacular. Cheers. Bye. So, Chris, any thoughts on that one? Well, I think he's uh, he's sticking to his homeland isn't he with uh, mm. with that particular quote perhaps i've got i mean i mean that that line is quite memorable i would say yes um the delivery was great the performance I think that was line, spot on. yeah yeah the performance was brilliant but i think that line most people i'd imagine would have a good idea as to who that might be yeah good stuff um, so yeah, good line it is too good stuff so thank you for that ralph uh, do be sure to uh, call in with the with the answer to that one and we'll uh, we'll play next time so that is the Cheers, quote ralph. round out of the way and mm-hmm. next up it is time for i think you should perform the title song to this section now oh, really? okay so <clears throat> the next round is get some music that was beautiful good stuff oh, thanks, so man. what have you got for us <laughs> Okay, so last week we had one which which was was a, was quite an interesting one actually. I think it's one that you you were around the right sort of area, um, but uh, I, well, let's just have a listen to it again and then and then see what people think. Here let's do that. Okay, so Mr. Tom Sears, what do you think of that music cue? So, like I said last time, it's kind of like it makes me think that string line. Nah, 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 it sounds like the opening bit to "You Only Live Twice," where it's like. But it doesn't sound quite like Japanesey enough to be "You Only Live Twice." It sounds like an older Bond. It sound it's definitely John Barry. I almost went with From Russia With Love, but it doesn't sound quite old enough to be From Russia With Love. It's definitely not Goldfinger. It's definitely not Thunderball. It's definitely not Doctor All Mary. of the things, all of the things that you've said so far are correct. Okay, so that leaves me, so it's not, well, that leaves me with one film left over, doesn't it? That leaves me with Diamonds Are Forever. So it must be Diamonds Are Forever. Can you tell me what scene from Diamonds Are Forever that is? <sighs> I would say um, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hazard a guess and I'm gonna say is it shall I give I you a clue yeah go on do you remember the music cue that we did last week yes what was that for that was the hovercraft chase oh <gasps> What was the first word you just said? Ah, oh. <laughs> very nice. That must be the hovercraft it's, trip across to Amsterdam. That's it. Just before he boards a hovercraft, that's some of the strings that you hear just after he, uh, he says goodbye to Money Penny. Very nice. Off. There Good we stuff. go. Do you know nice what? Stuff. Actually, so, there, there was uh, there was there's a, you can get the hovercraft uh, hovercraft across to the Isle of Wight, and ooh, nice. um, there was actually a hovercraft. One of the I think there was two of them they had in in the fleet, and one of them. The name of the boat itself was 007. That was its its craft. Really? Number. Yeah. I always used to look awesome. at that. Go, oh, Did you get a photo? Uh, maybe. I'm sure I have at some point in in the past. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, that was fun. I like I like a bit of that. Uh, so uh, I'll good. have to get on the hovercraft myself at some point. I've yeah, never man. been on one actually. That's I've sure been on you... a you've been on a little one. You know the one man job. But yeah. I've never been on like a proper passenger hovercraft. That would be so good. That's how you should have gone across to Amsterdam, surely. I know, yeah, I know, I know. Go. Good stuff. <laughs> so we got a new guest the music cue for this week. We have indeed. Yeah. Now this one, um, let me think. Now this one, I think, will be a bit easier than than the last one. 
right. um, in terms of the era, at least, anyway. So, anyway, yeah, let's have, let's have a listen to the let's, new Guess the Music Cue for this Let's have week. a listen. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Okay, yeah. good stuff. I like I like okay. a bit of that. You liking it? I do, do I do, think? and I I'm I'm reasonably confident. I've uh, I've got that one. That's uh, that's excellent work. So we'll obviously reveal the answer to that next time as well. Uh, and so- every anyone who wants a guess, uh, obviously send in a message or leave us a voicemail with your answers, and uh, yeah, and then you can find that next week. Beautiful stuff. So next up, it is time for the complete the lyric section. Very nice. Now it was your lyric last time, wasn't it? It was indeed. Okay, so which I think you uh, you definitely had a good idea on, and mm. my lyric was, <clears throat> "If that's all we have, you will find." We need nothing more. Oh, he nails or it. Or should I say, we need nothing more? <laughs> that, <laughs> that was brilliant. Thanks very uh, much. <laughs> so good. Can you do both lines in in Armstrong? What was your line again? Tell me your bit. Uh, if that's all we have, okay. you will find. If that's all we have, you will find. We need nothing more. That is so good. Man, I'm so (laughs) jealous of your Armstrong. (laughs) That's brilliant. Uh, I'll tell you what, cue the music are going to sign you up, boy. Oh, you know what? That should be it, shouldn't it? Guest guest vocalist with cue music. I'll I'll rock out my... uh, my, my Louis Armstrong impression. That'd be nice. Your I don't Louis, know whether I could yeah. get through a whole song of that though without like <laughs> giving myself a cough or something. But, uh, but there you go. Yeah, well, nice. good stuff. So nice. Have you got a lyric for me this week? I certainly do. Okay, so mm, are you ready? Are you prepared? Okay. <clears throat> Here's the deadpan performance. Okay. When the storm arrives, would you be seen with me? Oh, that's yeah. I haven't quite got that one. Mm, yeah, it is um, a can you say it again? Of course. When the storm arrives, would you be seen with me? For any new listeners' benefit, obviously, what we're looking for is the following line from that particular song. It's reasonably easy to find out what song it is. It's the following line that can uh, that can be a little bit tricky. Oh, I think you got me. I'll have to. I'll definitely have to play it a few times in my in my head and uh, see what I can come up with. <laughs> All right, cool, good stuff. Um, it's yeah, a shame good, Louis Armstrong didn't sing this one, but uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the final round of the uh, today's Bond game show quiz extravaganza, which is Bond Celebrity Deathmatch. Oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> okay. I like it. So. <laughs> <laughs> we are down to well we've got a few left so James Bond Celebrity Deathmatch so the rules of the game are I've got a list of uh, I think they're pretty much all Bond villains now we've we've removed the Bonds in the MI6 lot so I've got a list of Bond villain characters here I'm going to flick through the pile James Bond radio lovely uh, uh, pile there Tom's going to tell me to stop I'm going to pick out one I'm going to flick through again tell me to stop I'll pick out another and then we put them in a face to face to see who a goes face to face Champions League fantasy battle. Now, do you think it's worth removing all the MI6 people? Well, when I say MI6 people, I mean MQ Moneypenny. I imagine they would probably, with the exception of Q, I would imagine Moneypenny and M wouldn't fare particularly well, would they? No. There were, and it was female. Um, it was fe- it was yeah. Lewis Maxwell Moneypenny, and it was oh, there was Felix Leiter from from uh, Jeffrey Wright's Felix Leiter, but I took him out as well. All right. Okay, Maybe no, I think, I think that's in. fair enough. I think that's fair enough. Shall I put him back in? Let's have Felix know. back in. Yeah, we'll yeah, because I think he could actually. He, he, Do you know he, what? I would also like to. Business. I would also like to see Q back in there as well because he does have a lot really? of gadgets at his, at his disposal. Okay, and I think you know he okay. could outsmart some people. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we'll leave out M from Goldeneye, yeah. Money Penny from Doctor No. There's also strangely Pussy Galore from Goldfinger. Do you want her in it or not? Uh, yeah, let's have some. Let's have some pussy. I like it. Let's have some pussy. We we'll love yeah. a bit of pussy. Okay. Yeah. All right, all right, give me. All right, give me a second. I'll just give him a, a little shuffle. 
Okay, so dun, dun, dun. oh, I like Bon Slavi Death Match. Mm, good. So, do you remember too. who we had last week and who won last week? Yeah, obviously, last week was Xenia on the top versus um, Le Chief, wasn't it? Last week, it was indeed. And yeah, and I think we were pretty much both sure that Xena would wipe the floor with him yeah. in uh, yeah. several ways, really. Yeah, you? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Here are the cards, and I'm going to mm -hmm. start flicking, and you tell me when to stop. Ready? Okay, go. Stop. Okay, number one. Imagine if we get two of the people that I just put back in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, ready? And go. Stop. Okay. All right, so first up in today's James Bond Celebrity Deathmatch is... <laughs> Miss Pussy Galore. Very nice. There okay, she is. Cool stuff. So we so we got a bit of pussy. We want mm. a bit of pussy, and we, we've got a bit we, of pussy. We got some. Oh wow! This is actually really good. All right. Okay. Facing off against Pussy Galore is none other than Rosa Kleb Ooh. from Russia with Love. We've got now ourselves a bit of girl on girl action this week, Chris. Yeah, it, it's a it's a bit like the the wrestling match from from Russia with Love itself, isn't it? Yeah, it a bit is. Of girl on girl. Yeah. Wow. So, how do we make this is our first girl on girl fight, isn't it? It is absolutely. Um, so, okay, let's 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 weigh it up. Let's start with with Pussy Galore. Physically, is she capable of putting up a fight? I would say she's not shy of getting involved. Um, well, don't forget, she was she knows judo. She's she's flipped Bond in the hay. She's swiped his legs when he was listening under the Fort Knox thing. Yeah. So she's a master of judo. So yeah. she can handle herself. She's a pilot. Yeah. Um. So she's a good pilot. So she knows all of that. So in a hand to hand combat, she's not bad at all. She's not bad. That is at all. true. That is true. Very very well observed there. I've forgotten about the judo. Ooh, thing. I've just I've just thought of one other thing as well. Go on. Um. You know Rosa Klebb's partial to uh, a little bit you know of feminine what? action. It's funny you said that because that just crossed my mind as well. In, <laughs> yeah. Go on, I'll let you finish. Uh, yeah, uh, and then obviously Pussy has a little bit of that inclination, perhaps, but she is clever enough to know that. Look at her. I mean, Pussy Glow. How hot is Pussy Glow? Mm. One of the hottest Bond girls ever. Gorgeous, gorgeous uh, uh, Bond girl. Gorgeous character. And Rosa Klebb is going to be hard push. To not sort of be, be tempted, be lured. Yeah. So okay. So be lured in by pussy's yeah. looks. So in terms of, especially in the in the Goldfinger book, it's it's very obvious that uh, that pussy likes a little bit of lady action, and as does as Rhoda Cleb, as you say. So this is an interesting matchup. Would okay. So we've talked about pussy glow. Rosa Cleb, she is. Right. An horrible little woman, isn't she? She's got the spiky shoe. She's really yeah, with, devious and nasty. She's got a knuckle dusters. She's got that. Ca she's got the cane as well, she's and got, the knuckle dusters. Yeah. yeah. So she's 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 a dirty fighter. She's a dirty, scrappy fighter. She's armed, isn't she? She's she armed. is. So that just leads us to think: in terms of combat, would the knuckle dusters and the spiky shoe win over a trained judo person? because judo is all about sort of it's like wrestling moves essentially isn't it it's like holds yeah. and things like that yeah. would she prevail i don't know what are your thoughts on that i i think in terms of the knuckle duster i could see pussy glow managing to block an attack and throw rosa Kleb over her shoulder so mm. i think the knuckle duster she could probably because obviously when when rosa Kleb punches grant he's there as a you know just to stand there so he's not you mm. know trying to get out of the way i think i think pussy galore could avoid or block and then throw rosa Kleb over her shoulder that's true when it comes to the cane i think she could possibly do the same maybe grab a wrist and twist it to drop the cane mm -hmm. and then flip her over her shoulder the thing the hard thing i think would be the spiked shoes now yeah. basically if she gets kicked by that 12 seconds she's a goner mm -hmm. we know that yeah so she 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 you know bond had to use a chair pussy galore would have to would have to sort of think of something else now that is rosa clubs without a doubt her lethal sort of you know weapon her formidable weapon mm -hmm. but if it, it if it, if the build-up was pussy galore you know like we like we were saying almost luring her in yeah. to to mm -hmm. A, a bedroom situation. Showing a bit of leg or something, you know. Exactly. Yeah. 
and then and then that and plus she's got i mean i don't know if she'd ever use it but she has got her flying circus they could potentially you know be back up or do a bit of damage or something i'm not quite sure you know what could potentially happen is pussy galore's flying circus all show up in their flight suits with their cone-like babylons which could then distract kleb yeah. allowing pussy to get in there and kind of disable her and do a flip onto some hay possibly um yeah do you know is... what that reminds me of Go on. <laughs> you know austin powers when the fembots come in yes. and they're trying to distract him yeah. and then he turns the tables on them it's yeah, that's like very that. true yeah <laughs> margaret thatcher naked on a cold day um <laughs> yeah no you're right i feel like this one's a bit evenly matched in the sense that yeah. i feel it could go either way but yeah, I, I do. think deep down, I feel like uh, Pussy Galore could get her in some kind of judo hold and dispatch her like that. But Kleb is such a dirty fighter, I feel like the spike shoe would come out at that point. Yeah. And all it's got yeah. to do is just touch her quickly and it's game over. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning a little yeah. bit towards Kleb. How do you feel? Yeah, I think so. I think when I first saw them, I was like, well, straight away Kleb, because you're thinking, well, she's nasty. She's got mm. this, that and the other. And then I thought, well, hang on a minute. The judo aspect, the the lesbian aspect is a big thing as mm. well. I think, um, out of the seduction aspect, and then that really brought her back up. Mm. I think it all rests on that shoe. That's what it's about. Yeah. If if pussy galore, if that's the other thing about judo is it is close combat, isn't it? Yeah. Although it's it, you know, she can block maybe the knuckle dust or whatever. It is close combat, and that that lethal shoe, like you said, all it needs is, is a yeah. slight kick, and then she's gone. So. I mean, I, yeah. I am almost inclined to say this could be another one we pass out to the JBR listeners. Do you know what? I, I really think we should. I yeah. really think we should because I'm I'm surprised at how good Pussy Glory has turned out. Because when you look into it, she mm. is that she is good at all that sort of yeah. stuff, um, and she has and got the. Do you know what else I'm thinking as well? Is that a Kleb clearly doesn't get a lot of action, right? So if no. Pussy comes in and does her seduction skills on her, she could very well. Be like, oh, let's uh, let's let's take things to the bedroom. Let me take your yeah. shoes off. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There we go. I'll give you a nice foot massage. How yeah, about that? Yeah. Exactly. Kleb's not going to say Kleb no, is, is she? Yeah. And then Kleb is sort of disarmed with her main weapon. She's only got yeah. the knuckle duster and the cane, which yeah. we've already said Pussy Galore could quite easily I, I sort think. of, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is this is a controversial one. I'm I'm not sure which way to go. Yeah. I think pass that to the JBR listeners. See what they think. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm happy to do that for sure. Okay, so JBR listeners, we'll have to let you know, have to let us know who you think will win out of Rosa Kleb and Pussy Galore, taking into account the the cane, the knuckle duster, the poison shoe for Kleb, the judo ability of Pussy Galore, along with her extreme attractiveness, which mm. you could use to seduce Kleb and catch her off guard. Yeah. So there we go. And all the rest of us for that matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, certainly yeah. could with me. That's for sure. Yeah, completely. Um, brilliant. So uh, there we go. So, I, I'm really looking. I'm really interested to see how that fares. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Do you know what so I'm interested to see? Because obviously there are two levels to this. Well, there's going to be more than two levels in the sense that next yeah. up we have the Champions League where they all face off. So then once we get to the yeah. final of the final two people, it's going to be interesting yeah. to see who a who those two people are and b who the who the yeah. final winner is. But uh, yeah. Good stuff. I suppose we should give another shout out to my, Michael Kerwin, shouldn't we? Because this whole thing was his idea, wasn't it? His his whole Definitely. his whole first thing was a question was who would win in a fight between uh, Kleb and Bunt, and uh, it's yeah, developed right. into this huge thing. So good into on you, this. Michael, for, for yeah. giving us the yeah, idea. Yeah, cheers, Michael. Great um, stuff. Great idea. Yeah. Good stuff. So So, that about rounds out today's episode of James Bond Radio. Now, next time we are going to be doing our first MI6 mailbag episode, whereby we're going to be answering your questions and it's going to be all about you listeners. So um, we would like to invite you to either leave us a voicemail with questions or email with a question or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or tweet us, I should say, um, with with any questions, preferably the type that will stimulate conversation, you know, like like sort of open-ended questions, things like that. Um, and uh, and we will uh, we will read those and include those in the show next time. Um, and that's uh, that's just our, another way of us sort of like messing with the format a little bit and mixing things up a bit. Yeah. Mixing it up for sure. And another thing we'll look at is the uh, questions of the day have been super popular on Facebook. We we get a lot of responses to those, and they you know some of the questions are really good. You know, you mentioned one earlier. What with the fifth 
fifth Brosnan film be? You know, and mm. we've, we've had loads of good ones. So we'll probably pluck out a couple of those with each MI6 mailbag. Just look at the questions and the answers that we've had and yeah. have a little discussion about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Good Sounds stuff. Good. So until then, James Bond Radio will return. I've been Tom Sears. I've been Chris Wright. And we will see you next time. Goodbye. See you for Podcast 44 and the MI6 mailbag. See you guys. Bye. This is the part I really like.